Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today for our community conversation with Sierra Club Maine and our guest speaker, Katie Cantrell. Uh, my name is Marina Bach. I'm the communications manager here at Sierra Club Maine, and I'm gonna be helping to facilitate our call today. Before we begin, I just wanna go through some Zoom logistics. If, you've, if you uh, like closed captioning, we do have live transcri transcriptions enabled. Um, we ask that you please keep your microphone on mute just to help with any background noise. And just wanted to let you know that this is being recorded for folks who aren't able to join us. So you're welcome to stay on or off video at your choosing. And then lastly, we ask that you put any questions in the chat and I'll be monitoring the chat as we go and as Katie presents and we'll have some time at the end for some Q&A. And I just wanna take a moment to acknowledge the indigenous land that we're on here in Maine. We're in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawn. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy and Penobscot nations and the native communities who have lived here for thousands of generations in what is known today as Maine, New England, and the Canadian Maritimes. Sierra Club Maine is honored to collaborate with the Wabanaki as they share their stories. And we thank the Abbey Museum for their efforts in decolonization efforts and their work to create effective land acknowledgements. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our guest speaker, Katie, for, with, to you all. Um, Katie is the Director of Corporate Outreach for the Better Food Foundation and the founder of the Factory Farming Awareness Coalition. For more than a decade, Katie has led workshops on the social and ecological hazards of industrial animal agriculture and consulted on food policy at universities, government agencies, and Fortune 500 corporations. Her materials have been used as a resource by food justice advocates around the world. So welcome, Katie. We're so excited to have you here today, and I will pass it over to you to get started. Fantastic. Thank you so much. I will just go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right. Can you all see that? Okay, perfect. Thanks. All right, so thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here today. Um, again, my name is Katie Cantrell, and I've been in the plant-based and sustainable food space for over a decade. And um, just to tell you a little bit more about my background, what actually got me excited about the job I'm doing now is not that history, but my um, the, what I studied in undergrad, I got a bachelor's in psychology <clears throat> from UC Berkeley. And um, it's more of the psychology of uh, behavior change that got me excited about the job that I'm doing now. You know, I spent about a decade talking to people about the food system, trying to change their attitudes in order to change their behavior, which is really difficult work. It's a, it's a hard topic um, and it's hard for people to make change. And then with the job I'm doing now, it just really flipped the paradigm. So we're trying to change people's behavior in order to change their attitude. Um, that's the beauty of defaults. So that's just kind of a little teaser of the solution that I'll be getting to. Um, first, I will talk a little bit about why food is such a, a potent sustainability initiative, and then what we can do about it, um, both in our own individual lives and also as members of any institutions. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to drop them in the chat throughout the presentation, and then we'll have time at the end to get to them. As Dr. Jonathan fully explained in National Geographic, when we think about threats to the environment, we tend to picture cars and smokestacks, not dinner. But the truth is, our need for food poses one of the biggest dangers to the planet. And within the food system, there's one sector that has an outsized impact, animal agriculture. Globally, animal agriculture uses 77% of all farmland and produces 57% of all food-associated greenhouse gas emissions, but produces only 18% of the protein. So its footprint is really outsized. Um, it's disproportionate compared to the amount of food that's actually produced by animal agriculture. And the reason for that um, is, you, as you can see here, animal products have a huge carbon footprint. So the foods with the three largest footprints are beef, lamb, and cheese. Now, oftentimes people will encourage people to switch from beef to chicken because chicken has a much lower greenhouse gas footprint than beef, which is certainly true. But even chicken still has a green uh, carbon footprint 11 times greater um, than lentils and peas and beans. 
So plant-based proteins really give you the most bang for your buck. And globally, they produce most of the world's protein with a tiny fraction of the carbon footprint. So, um, sorry, let me just move this. Um, so when we think about um, our food, we tend to picture what's above the waterline in this uh, iceberg infographic slash metaphor here. So we think of our individual food and water consumption and our individual food waste. But there's so much going on beneath the waterline that we don't see. And all of this happens before those products hit the grocery store shelves or hit the restaurant. Um, so this includes you know, all of the feed that the animals are given, all the manures that they produce, the resulting methane and nitrous oxide, the water pollution, um, environmental racism. There's, I, you know, I, I could and have spoken for several hours just about the um, environmental devastation that's caused by animal agriculture. But you know, I just wanna give you a really brief snapshot today um, so that we can start to understand why changing our food uh, choices is such a, such a powerful action to take. So um, one of the issues with animal agriculture is it's an extremely inefficient use of feed and of land. So here, this is an amazing infographic from Bloomberg um, showing the different uses of land in the United States. And you can see by far the single largest use of land is cow pasture and uh, graze land. So this is a much larger area than the amount of prairie that's left in the United States. So there is some land that is more, um, has naturally evolved with um, grazing animals, namely buffalo in the United States. Um, but cattle are now being grazed on land that's been deforested, on land that should be marsh and des and um, has and forest and has now essentially become deserts because of overgrazing. <clears throat> and then if you look to the right of the square, you see um, one of the other large uses of land is for livestock feed. So this is all of the corn and soy that's grown to feed to animals that are being raised on factory farms. And then above that, you can see all of the land to raise the rest of the food that we eat is less than half of the land that's used to grow feed for animals on factory farms. So this little square here, that's all of the veggies and legumes and grains and fruits, everything else that we are eating. Um, it's much less land than is used to grow feed for livestock. So um, studies have found that if everyone in the US ate a plant-based diet, because it's such a more efficient use of land, we could feed over, we could feed basically twice as many people as they are, are in the United States. We could feed everyone in the US right now, plus an extra 300 million people. And we could basically reforest all of this um, pasture land. So there's this rewilding movement. And a huge part of that is using our land more efficiently and restoring this land that's being used for monoculture corn and soy to feed to animals on factory farms and land that's currently being overgrazed. That could be returned to natural habitat um, that becomes a huge carbon sink. This land use is a, huge, is a huge problem globally. Meat production is the leading cause of the Amazon rainforest being cut down to make grazing land for beef cattle and land to grow corn and soy that are fed to animals on factory farms. So sometimes people hear that the Amazon is being cut down for soy and they think, oh, it's all those vegetarians and vegans drinking soy milk and eating soy yogurt but actually the vast majority of that soy is going to feed animals on factory farms. Um, so it's, it's part of the meat industry. Animals also use a disproportionate amount of water. So this infographic that you see here is from the New York Times and it compares the emissions, land use and water use of cow milk versus plant-based milks. And you can see that by every measure, cow milk is by far the most resource intensive. Now what surprises a lot of people is that almond milk here in the bottom right uses considerably less water than cow milk does. Um, a few years ago during the drought in California, there was a lot of bad press around almonds and how water intensive they are. And it's true, they are more water intensive than other plant-based products, but they still use less water to produce than cow milk does. So even switching from cow milk to almond milk is still having a net positive impact. Oops, sorry. Um, but the most efficient product, if you really wanna do the best you possibly can is probably oat milk, oat and soy milk both have very, very low environmental footprints. And actually, um, this huge difference that you see here in water, um, if you skip a gallon of milk, you save as much water as you would by not showering for an entire month. And the same is true of meat. So switching from a hamburger to a veggie burger just once um, saves as much water as if you did not shower for an entire month. 
So, you know, again, if you think back to that iceberg infographic, when we think about saving water, we think of our direct water usage. But by far, the biggest um, contributor to our water footprint on a daily basis is actually our food crisis. And then to make matters worse, um, animal agriculture not only uses a disproportionate amount of water, but it also pollutes the water that's remaining. So manure runoff from factory farms is a leading cause of water pollution in the United States, and also um, the leading cause of the um, dead zone, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Gulf of Mexico. And then the final issue, um, of course, is climate change. Together, the world's top five meat and dairy corporations are actually responsible for more greenhouse gas emissions than ExxonMobil, Shell, or BP. And unfortunately, that's not all that <laughs> they have in common. Um, just like big oil, big meat also spends millions of dollars crushing climate policy and sowing confusion about whether or not meat is actually contributing to climate change. So they sponsor blog posts, they sponsor articles, um, and they, they um, keep scientific studies from being published. They lobby the government to keep climate action from being taken. And actually, um, this was great investigative reporting that found that big meat actually spends a larger percentage of its budget on crushing climate policy than even big oil does. And that's because they, they know that they're in the crosshairs next. Um, meat is such a large contributor to climate change it, the focus has to come around to them at some point, and they're trying to put that off as long as possible to keep consumers in the dark. There's been a lot of talk about methane. This is one of the um, big focuses um, of COP26. One of the main agreements that governments have, have taken is agreeing to cut um, methane by 30% by 2030. And animal agriculture is responsible for about 40% of all methane, methane emissions globally. Um, and in the short term, it's 80 times more potent than CO2. So that's why it's one of the big focuses lately is because um, cutting methane has really immediate um, effects, whereas cutting carbon is, is very important, um, but it's more of a, a long-term effect. So by cutting methane, we can help really curb climate change in the short term while we get our act together um, to also stop it in the long term. But this focus on methane has led to a lot of greenwashing. And I want to, this is a little bit wonky, but you know, since you're an environmental organization, I wanted to take just a couple of minutes to talk about this. Um, so in California, where they have um, basically cap and trade that, you know, they have a carbon market and potentially federally, um, we are possibly on the cusp of this, you know, if the Senate can get their act together. Um, so in California, companies are getting carbon credits for recapturing methane. And a lot of these credits are going to dairy factory farms. And the government is actually paying for these factory farms to build methane digesters using taxpayer money. And then the factory farms get the money from those credits. So taxpayers are further subsidizing factory farming. Um, you know, methane digesters are a great technology for uh, recapturing methane, making sure it doesn't go into the air and generating energy. But they're not necessarily a green solution and they're certainly not an equitable solution because digesters actually emit other air pollutants um, that disproportionately harm communities of color when they are built on factory farms because factory farms are almost always located near communities of color. So they're actually perpetuating environmental racism. And then the big problem is that um, Big Ag is using these carbon credits to further invest in expanding factory farms. And so, you know, this is a, a really uh, pressing issue as we're getting more and more money for methane digesters, methane recapture, to make sure that it's done in a way that's not just entrenching factory farming. So now they're saying, you know, it could be that dairy farms and especially dairy factory farms and these large factory farms are primarily producing methane and milk is a byproduct of it rather than, you know, vice versa. So it's really important that we make sure that, you know, as consumer preferences are changing, that factory farms don't continue business as usual thanks to this uh, subsidized money from methane recapture. So, this is kind of the, the latest frontier in the fight against factory farming. And then another issue that comes up a lot um, is grass fed and this idea that beef can actually be a, a climate solution because uh, grazing creates carbon sinks. Um, this idea has not been verified in independent scientific studies. So the largest study that's been conducted at Oxford University, grazed and confused, looked at uh, all the different types of grazing systems and found that even in the best managed systems, grass-fed livestock um, are net contributors to the climate problem. It's still a net, um, net uh, contributor of carbon 
Um, so grazing livestock, you know, are not a climate solution. They're a climate problem as are all livestock. And the same report said that, you know, eating less meat is really the only way to help with this. So more and more scientific studies are showing that we simply cannot continue business as usual when it comes to our food system. It is quite literally unsustainable. The World Resources Institute and several other scientific papers have found that without changing diets, agriculture alone could produce enough emissions to surpass one and a half degrees of warming. Um, so basically what this means is that if every other sector, um, so energy, transportation, buildings, became completely carbon neutral by 2050, but we leave the food system to continue on its current trajectory, we will still fail to meet the Paris Climate Accord. So food is a critical piece of the climate solution. Now, the good news is that there is an easy way to change this. So um, namely eating more plant-based foods. Greenhouse gas emissions of plant-based meals are on average 63% lower than the emissions of animal-based meals. So this is one of the most effective sustainability interventions that we can take. Um, so this, um, sorry, I know this is kind of blocking your view, um, but basically um, what you can see here is um, that, um, let's see, I'm trying to move this out of the way. Um, so this, this infographic, um, they compared sustainability interventions done at different events. So like at schools or um, community events, they studied different interventions and the, their, car, their climate impact. They found the single most effective intervention is switching from hamburgers to veggie burgers. After that is reducing the portion size of beef by 25%. Um, whereas other things that we tend to think of um, as being sustainability interventions, like using 100% recycled plastic or even eliminating single use plastic altogether, you know, they're great um, for other reasons, reducing plastic pollution is certainly an important environmental issue. But in terms of the climate impact, it's pretty much nil. Um, by far the most effective thing that we can do is to um, reduce the amount of meat, especially beef that's being served. And the other good news is that this has, uh, the plant-based movement is exploding. So um, in the last few years, there's just been this unprecedented growth of plant-based foods. Um, the CEO of Starbucks said it's the most dominant shift in consumer behavior that he's seen. Um, plant-based menu items have increased over 800% in the last four years. Over half of all households are now buying plant-based foods. And a quarter of Americans have recently reduced their meat consumption, including a third of non-white Americans. So this is a really hot and growing trend. Now, who's driving this trend? It's mostly young people and omnivores. So the vast majority of Gen Zers and millennials are already eating plant-based foods at least a couple of times a week and wanna be eating plant-based foods even more often. What's more interesting is that almost half of households that buy plant-based milks also buy cow milk and almost all consumers who are buying plant-based meats also buy animal-based meats. And this is actually great news because it means that the solution is not getting everyone to go vegan. It's encouraging this trend of so-called flexitarianism. So getting omnivores to realize that we don't need a giant hunk of meat in the middle of our plate at every meal. Getting omnivores to eat more plant-based foods more often is how we can make the biggest change the most quickly. So that's really what motivates our work. And we are um, influenced by behavioral economics, specifically the book Nudge by uh, Nobel laureate Richard Thaler and Harvard professor Cass Sunstein, which looks at the impacts of defaults and nudges on human behavior. Defaults are the option that people end up with if they don't make an active choice. So a classic example of this is ringtones. Um, most of us, myself included, probably still have the default ringtone that our phone came with because we never actively made a choice to change it. Now, for many different reasons, people have a really strong tendency to stick with the status quo or the default option. Partly that's because it's easier. It's one less choice to make for our already overtaxed brains and partly because it's seen as a more normal option, the thing that most people are doing. You know, we're social creatures, we don't like to stand out, we like to fit in. And sticking with the default is the surest way to fit in. If you, if you don't stick with the default, you're kind of going against the grain um, and standing out and that can be uncomfortable for people. So um, one of the most talked about examples of the power of defaults is organ donations. So countries where people are by default not organ donors and they have to actively opt into it have much lower participation rates than countries where people by default are organ donors and have to actively opt out of it. And this 
uh, change has really life-saving consequences, of course, um, because the more people who donate their organs, the more lives you can save. And so you can affect that just by having to check a box um, to not be an organ donor versus checking a box to be an organ donor. To give you an example that is drawn more from the sustainability world, um, this study looked at energy defaults that are being used by companies to power their factories um, and their stores. So in the control, conventional energy is the default and businesses have a choice to opt into renewable energy. Um, and you can see here that when conventional is the default, basically 100% of businesses are sticking with that conventional energy default. So then for the experiment, they flipped it. They made renewable energy the default and gave businesses the choice to opt out into conventional energy. And they found that you can see, you know, this has a huge increase in the number of businesses that are using renewable energy. About 70% 70, 70 of businesses stick with that renewable energy default and it's consistent over time. So we see that it's not just that they weren't paying attention to their energy bill in year one and they got tricked into it, but they're content to stick with the default, whether that's conventional energy or more sustainable renewable energy. So when you combine these two ideas, um, plant-based foods and defaults, you get greener by default. So the idea is really simple. We're looking to flip the norm. So right now, basically everywhere meat is the default. People have to specially opt in to plant-based options. We just wanna make plant-based the default and give people the choice to opt into meat and dairy. So nothing is taken off the menu. People still have complete freedom of choice, but we're making the more sustainable option the default. Um, we have strategies to implement this in any type of food environment, and it's cost neutral and can even save money. It's also more inclusive. Serving plant-based foods that meet the needs of those with more specific diets while giving people the option to add meat and dairy includes everyone by default. Whereas when you have a meat and dairy default, that excludes the 30 to 50 million Americans who are lactose intolerant, the majority of whom are people of color, it excludes the many different religions that encourage vegetarianism, um, including you know, Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, Rastafarianism, Seventh-day Adventism, and those that restrict certain animal products like Judaism and Islam. Um, it also includes the younger people who, as we've talked about, are more likely to be eating, to want to eat more plant-based foods, and the communities of color who are more likely to be reducing their meat consumption. And actually black Americans are twice as likely to be vegan as white Americans. So, it's more inclusive of all of these different types of people while still also being inclusive of people who wanna eat meat with every meal. And this is effective. So there was a study done at the Harvard Kennedy School at an event and in the control, um, just like pretty much every event, meat was the default and you can check a box to specially request a vegetarian option. Um, they had actually 25, about 25% of people did request a veg option, which is a lot more than we would expect in the general public but 75% of people still stuck with that meat default. Then they flipped it. So they made vegetarian the default and gave people the choice to opt into meat. And when they did that, they found that about two thirds of people stuck with that veg default and a third opted back into meat. So this is a 43% increase in the number of people eating veg meals. A study in Denmark found even more dramatic results. So same, uh, same experimental design, uh, in the default or in the control condition, meat was the default. Um, only 2% of people requested a vegetarian option. And then they flipped it. So they made vegetarian the default and let people request meat. And when they did that, 87% of people stuck with that veg option, about 13% requested meat. So this is an 80% increase in the number of people eating veg meals just by making veg the default. So when we take these results and extrapolate them, um, a company with a thousand employees that's serving lunch every day um, during the week, over the course of a year would save 9 million gallons of water and 350,000 kilograms of carbon equivalent. So these are much bigger impacts than other infrastructure investments that we think of like installing low flow toilets or solar arrays. And it's cost neutral or cost savings, whereas those infrastructure investments have a large upfront cost. So how does this work exactly? Um, I'm gonna talk briefly about what this looks like in different environments. So the core idea is to make your base plant-based, you know, serve plant-based with the option to opt into meat and dairy. So for buffets and family style, this can mean offering plant-based entrees um, and then having meat and dairy available at the end of the line, um, ideally in small containers with small um, serving utensils. So, you know, there's so many subtle cues that affect how much food we take. 
Um, and if something is, is placed last with smaller containers, we're likely to take less of it. So then it becomes more of a garnish rather than the, the center of our plate. If people are SVPing for meals, you can state that the food will be plant-based by default and offer a box to check if guests would like to opt into meat the same way that right now they check a box to indicate they need a vegetarian or a gluten-free option. And then we work with restaurants and advise them to offer meat and dairy as add-ons. Um, so make the base meal plant-based and have meat and dairy um, for an additional cost. And we're already used to this for things like salads or bowls. If it's not possible to make the entree entirely plant-based, we recommend offering a minimum ratio of two to one plant-based to animal-based options. And this helps create the perception that plant-based is the default. So there's actually a study that was done at Cambridge that found that increasing the ratio of veg to meat from one to three to two to two increased the take rate of veg options by 60%. And the reason for this is that when there's one veg option, omnivores see that as being just for vegetarians. So they think, oh, that's not for me. Um, and actually, you know, in some workplaces, I'll, I talk to a lot of um, vegetarians and vegans who say that they have to fight off their coworkers from taking the veg option because if they do, there won't be enough food for vegetarians and vegans to eat. Um, but you know, if it's a delicious option, if it's colorful and looks healthy, a lot of people wanna try it. So when it's more plentiful, um, there's more of it to go around. And also the focus doesn't become on the fact that it's a vegetarian option, but just the fact of, you know, do I feel like pasta or risotto or salad or lasagna today? Suddenly it's not about, oh, that's the vegetarian option. Another great strategy is subtle substitutions. Um, so serving plant-based condiments, milks, desserts, and breads by default. Again, this is more inclusive because it meets the needs of people with allergies and dietary restrictions. And products are so good that people won't even notice a difference. So we work with UCLA and their dining hall was actually, um, they were trialing a vegan brownie and they did taste tests and found that everyone preferred the taste of the vegan brownie um, in blind taste tests. And so it tasted better. Um, more people could eat it, it's cheaper for them to make, and it has a lower carbon and water footprint. So it's really a win-win. And now they only serve those vegan brownies. That's their default brownie recipe. Um, so this is something that you can do in your daily life. You know, even if you're not vegan, if you're going to a potluck or hosting a dinner party, um, you can make the dessert vegan. You can make sides vegan by using um, vegan butter, vegan milks. Um, you know, Thanksgiving is coming up, something like mashed potatoes, super easy to make vegan. Um, even if you're not vegan and your family's not, it still has a much lower carbon and water footprint. And really people can't notice a difference in taste. So this is a, a super easy intervention. And then if there's going to be a printed menu, um, it's important to incorporate the vegetarian dishes into the main menu. So um, there was an experiment that was done um, they had on the right, you can see there's a separate vegetarian menu. They're kind of segregated in their own section down at the bottom. Um, and people, when that's the case, people are 56% less likely to order the vegetarian option versus when they're just incorporated into the main menu and listed first. Again, because when omnivores look at this main menu, they just, the first thing that's, that hits their eye is risotto primavera. And they think, hmm, that sounds delicious. I'm going to order that. Versus when they look at this menu, an omnivore would think, oh, I'm not vegetarian. I'm not even gonna look at that vegetarian section. They think again, it's not for me. That's just for vegetarians. And another important thing that contributes to omnivores, you know, feeling um, excited about ordering plant-based foods is how they're labeled. So if they're labeled with names that are focused on the taste, the texture and the provenance where the flavors are from, rather than really advertising a food as vegetarian, vegan, and meatless, or as healthy, low fat, really increases the take rate. So the World Resources Institute's Better Buying Lab did a study in the UK, and they found that renaming meat-free sausages, sausages and mash to Cumberland Spice veggie sausages and mash increased sales by 76%. And this picture that we see here on the right, you know, we can imagine, I mean, this is a beautiful cake, but a lot of people are probably deterred by the fact that it's labeled as a decadent vegan chocolate cake. Um, either because, you know, omnivores think, oh, that's just for vegans, it's not for me, or there is still a stigma around vegan food. And so they think, oh, that's not going to taste good. So imagine how many more people would order it if it were just labeled as decadent chocolate cake. And, you know, people care about whether it tastes good or not. not most people don't go into a, a restaurant thinking, I want a cake that has eggs in it. You know, that's not our, our main priority is not that it has animal products in it, but that it tastes delicious um, and that it's indulgent. And so if something is just labeled with taste descriptors rather than prominently labeled as vegan, 
people are more likely to choose it. So that's the core idea. Um, we work with businesses, with universities, um, with organizations and nonprofits, conferences and restaurants to put these strategies into action. Um, and we basically do everything we can to make it as easy as possible, um, completely free of charge. We are a nonprofit, we are mission driven, just trying to make plant-based the default in as many places as possible. So um, that is the conclusion of the presentation. So um, this is our website, greenerbydefault.org. Um, you can go there and sign up. We have an email list. Um, this is my email address. Um, I would love to hear from you. Um, sorry, please ignore the uh, bottom section. I just spoke to the Climate Reality Project. So that was for them. Um, but you know, I, I'll, I'll stop now so that we can get to Q&A. Um, but I would really love to work with you, you know, to implement a greener by default policy, um, both for Sierra Club, um, for the main chapter, and also for any institutions that you might be a part of. So other community groups, faith communities, universities, workplaces, uh, we, you know, we're working to implement this in as many places as possible. So I will stop sharing and check out the chat. Thanks so much, Katie. Uh, lots of interesting information and ideas in there. Um, we do have one question so far from Noelle. She's wondering, have you been able to move into school cafeterias? Yeah, so we are working with universities. We're not working with K-12. Um, you know, it's really important and it's really admirable and we partner with other orgs that work with K-12, but there's a lot of um, limitations when it comes to school meals, you know, namely um, the federal funding for school meals is so minimal. It's usually just like a dollar per meal. And so they're working with the cheapest possible foods they can get. And because meat and dairy are subsidized, the government actually buys up extra um, meat and dairy that consumers don't buy and they put it into the school lunch program at a really discounted cost. So plant-based foods, even just fruits and vegetables and beans are often prohibitively expensive for schools to serve. Um, and also a lot of the times, like there's just one central kitchen, they're, they're buying a lot of prepackaged foods, a lot of processed foods, whereas plant-based foods to get them to taste good, you have to cook them from scratch. Um, usually they don't work well with the heat and serve models that schools are using. Um, so, you know, also for public schools, the, the decisions are made at the district level. And so there's a lot of bureaucracy. So, you know, there's a number of different reasons that we've decided with our limited you know, time and funds, we're focusing on universities where students have a lot more power um, to influence what dining is doing. So if there's demand for plant-based foods, um, university dining services are better equipped and have more budget to, to meet that demand. Um, so we have had a lot of success with universities and actually we're doing a study with UCLA and with Stanford, <clears throat> excuse me, and Harvard on um, plant-based defaults at student events. Um, but yeah, we don't work with schools directly. Um, Friends of the Earth is a really fantastic organization that works with school districts. And actually they're introducing legislation at a state and federal level to increase the funding for school meals um, if they're serving plant-based options. So that's there's kind of some key policies that need to change in order to make it more feasible to serve plant-based foods um, at schools. But with that said, um, if, you are, if you know of any um, private schools or charter schools, they likely have more freedom and more capacity. Great, thanks, Katie. And Becky is wondering, are you promoting the Gates model of reconstituted protein? Um, I'm not sure exactly what you mean by that. There's, so there's um, plant-based proteins and there's um, cultivated meats. Um, I think the Gates Foundation has invested in both. Um, so, you know, we, we don't promote any particular foods um, or brands or anything like that. You know, we're promoting plant-based proteins. So, um, you know, some like corporations that we work with want to switch from hamburgers to veggie burgers and some want to switch to more plant-based meals um, or, you know, so-called whole foods plant-based meals, which is less processed foods. But, you know, what I tell people, because I know there's a lot of controversy, especially within the environmental movement around the more processed plant-based proteins. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I like certainly it's better for people's health and for the health of the planet to eat less processed foods. Um, the closer you can get to food in its original form, the better. But you know, the reality is the average American eats a fast food hamburger three times per week. So asking someone who's going to McDonald's or Burger King three times a week to switch to a lentil and kale salad is just not gonna happen. You know, people don't have the taste for it. They don't know how to cook it. Um, 
It can cause indigestion to switch to really high fiber diet. Sorry, my cat's uh, having fun here. Um, you know, if you're used to a really low fiber diet that's full of fat and salt and sugar, just switching overnight to a really low processed diet um, is not really a feasible ask. And so I think of it like harm reduction. It's kind of like a bridge food to get someone from eating fast food, factory farm meat to eating more plant-based foods. And, you know, I mean, there have been independent LCAs done. Um, the carbon footprint of the Beyond Burger, for instance, is minuscule compared to the carbon footprint of a hamburger. And we just don't have time. Like, yes, in an ideal world, everyone would be, you know, eating unprocessed diets. They're cooking themselves from small farms. But we have, you know, probably less than 10 years at this point to end factory farming. And meat consumption is actually continuing to grow globally. Factory farming is expanding globally. So I, to me, whatever solutions we can muster to switch people away from factory farm meat as quickly as possible, we need all hands on deck. We need all possible solutions. So, you know, I think, I do think that plant-based meats are an important part. Like people who don't have access to farmer's markets or places where they can buy food, you can now get a plant-based burger at Burger King or Carl's Jr. Now at McDonald's. So it's also an equity issue too, because, you know, pasture-based meats are very expensive and they're hard to access. Um, and even, you know, unfortunately, a lot of unprocessed plant-based foods can also be hard to access. And for people who don't have time to cook them, it's not necessarily a realistic solution. So, you know, I do think that plant-based proteins um, like Beyond and Impossible are a key part of the solution, but we certainly as an organization are not advocating for them. Um, just saying that, you know, for people who feel like they can't go from burgers to lentils, that is a possible solution. Um, and then cultivated meat, um, you know, there's been a lot of controversy, especially lately over how feasible that technology is. So it's basically growing, um, it's using like medical technology to grow animal protein um, in a medium. So the same way that we like grow human skin cells to graft onto burn victims, growing animal muscle tissue to eat as meat. Um, it is much more efficient because you're just growing the animal that you, the part of the animal that will be eaten um, versus having to sustain and feed an animal throughout its whole life cycle. Um, so it does have a much lower carbon and water and land footprint. But right now it's still very expensive and they're only producing it on a small scale. So, you know, if it does scale up to the point that it could replace factory farmed meat, like in fast food, that's not going to be for probably at least another 10 years, maybe more like another 20 years. So it doesn't look like that's a feasible solution in the time frame that we need. Um, although some people have said, you know, if people really refuse to stop eating burgers three times a week, maybe they could at least come from cultivated meat rather than from factory farmed meat. But that's, you know, it's kind of a gamble um, at this point. It's unclear if it can scale to the level that, that would be necessary. All right, thank you for that. Um, one question that I had is, I know we kind of touched a little bit on the um, fake meat substitutes. So I'm thinking, you know, Beyond Burgers, Impossible, even the corn brand. Um, are those healthy substitutes um, in relation to an actual meat burger or should we focus more obviously on the, um, the plant-based, you know, beans and lentils and the foods as they come. So are, is it a, a healthy option? Yeah, so again, it's, it's healthier, um, but it's still not healthy. So, you know, like no burger, no one should be eating burgers every day for dinner, be that a meat burger or a vegan burger. Like donuts are not healthy, whether they're vegan or not. Um, so, you know, Miyoko, who makes like some of the best vegan butter and cheeses, like she'll tell you, you know, it's still butter. It's still not a health food. Um, but, you know, that being said, um, they, it doesn't have any cholesterol. It has, um, most of them don't have saturated fat, much less fat in general. So it is still healthier, um, especially for people with heart issues, um, high blood pressure. Um, but, you know, they do still have quite a bit of fat that most of them have a lot of sodium. Um, so the same way that you wouldn't consider it healthy to eat a burger every day for dinner, same thing, you know, I mean, some like veggie burgers, you know, you can make your own like black bean and sweet potato burger. Um, that is actually healthy, but the processed ones that you're buying in the store, um, you know, it's not a health food, but it is still healthier. So from that like harm reduction perspective, 
it's better for people to eat veggie burgers rather than hamburgers, but even better for them to like make their own lentil burger. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's just about meeting people where they are and figuring out what's realistic for them. We don't want to let perfect be the enemy of the good. And that's something that I see so often is people get really overwhelmed by either health or sustainability. You know, every food has a downside, the harder you look. And so it's easy for people to just throw up their hands and say, you know what, this is all too complicated. It's too difficult. I'm just going to go back to eating what I know, which is fast food hamburgers. So, you know, that's why I really encourage people to do what you can as often as you can, wherever you can start. Um, so that's, yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's our approach. Awesome. Thank you, Katie. And makes, makes total sense. <laughs> um, Becky has a comment about, um, she's a small factor, uh, family farmer who raises animals and she has seen a significant advantage in the compositing of waste to incorporate into her garden. Um, she says that she has an operation to remove invasives. Oh, composting. Um, she has an operation to remove invasives using animals rather than chemical herbicides that are normally used to restrict that product. Um, she's questioning the assumptions made that say all animals in rotational grazing scenarios are significant GHG producers. Yeah, so um, it's not an assumption. There are scientific studies. I can send you the links. Um, they, they conducted, you know, life cycle analyses of animals in different rotational grazing systems. But, you know, I mean, small farmers like certainly are not the problem. It's just an issue of scale. So if you're looking at producing enough meat to meet anywhere near the current demand, um, there was actually just a study done that found that only 30% of the current demand for beef could be met with the amount of pasture land that we have in the United States. Um, so, you know, if everyone reduced their beef consumption by 70%, then yes, like we could sustainably meet the demand for beef with pasture-based systems. But even then, you know, the, to have a true closed loop, those animals can't be removed from the system. If you look at like prairies and natural grazing systems, those animals die on the land and their bodies decompose and go back into the soil and that nourishes the soil. Um, and so when you have, you know, if you're trying to graze for, um, for profit and to, to do it more at scale, you just end up compromising that closed loop system. So absolutely small farmers, if you're doing it at a very small scale, can be done very sustainably. But when you look at scaling that up to meet even a small fraction of the current demand for meat, then you start to compromise the system. So yes, like certainly not saying it can't be done sustainably at a small scale, but that's not a, it's not a feasible solution nationally, um, unless we're gonna deforest the rest of the land that's remaining, remaining um, and turn it all into, into rangeland. Yes, absolutely, Big Ag would like to get rid of small farming and they make it really hard for small farmers to make a profit. Absolutely. Thanks, Katie. Um, just to know if you wanted to share any of those, those scientific um, links that you shared, I'm going to be sending a follow-up email to all of the registrants. So if you want to send it to me, I can, um, I'm happy to forward it on to those people. Okay, great. Thanks. Yeah, I'll do that. Any other questions for Katie? All right, any other closing um, comments or questions for the audience that you would like to share, Katie? Well, I guess just, you know, um, to give it some thought and if you can think of any institutions that might be a good fit for this, um, we'd love to work with you. So, you know, my specialty is, is workplaces, um, so working with businesses. Um, but again, also, if you know any students at universities, we do a lot of work there. And we are really trying to, we actually have a kind of a campaign to um, get environmental organizations to implement food policies. A lot of environmental groups don't have any kind of food policy on the book. So they buy, you know, some environmental groups buy factory farm food to serve at their events talking about how we need to stop climate change. So we're trying to get environmental groups to really walk the walk. And even if food is not a focus of the work, still like, you know, it's kind of the least that we can do when we are buying food for events to make sure that it's food that was sustainably raised and grown. Um, so, you know, we think Greener by Default is a nice way to do that because again, you know, it's not taking meat entirely off the menu, but it's establishing plant-based as the default. So, um, you know, if, if Sierra Club is interested in implementing that as an internal policy, we would love to work with you. 
Um, and again, if, yeah, if you are part of any other, um, any other institutions, yeah, you know, I mean, unfortunately, the school food is just too big of a fight for us at the moment. Um, but universities, um, private institutions, we will work with. Um, so, um, yeah, please feel free to reach out. And also, if you have any questions about any of the uh, the studies or if you want nutritional info or recipes, anything like that, I, I love to talk with folks. So um, please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and I really, I really do appreciate the um, thought of by default. So we're meeting people where they're at and still giving everyone the option that they want and need. Um, that's really great. So if there are no other questions, I'm gonna share my screen one more time just for a couple of closing slides. Um, I wanna thank everyone so much for joining us today and for being open-minded to all of this and adapting um, what we've been taught or know to kind of um, go with the ways of the world and how things are changing and what we need to do. Um, so, and a special thank you to Katie so much. Um, it's been really interesting we've loved having you. Um, and definitely thinking about taking all of these practices into play and how we can uh, incorporate them into our own lives and kind of help our family and friends see some things as, as well. Um, so we invite everyone to uh, stay updated on our work. You can follow us on social media or subscribe to our newsletter at, on our website. I will also, like I said, be sending up a, sending a follow-up email um, with some links if Katie would like to share those. And um, just thank you everyone so much. I did before we go, I just want to put a plug for our next community conversation, which is next Tuesday, November 16th at noon. We'll be joined by Trevor Cohen, who is the author of Bright Green, Free, Bright Green Future. Excuse me. Um, the book offers a glimpse into a fully sustainable future through the inspiring stories of innovators and activists. So I hope you can join us. I'll actually put a link to register for that in the chat. Um, and then also, thank Katie, thank you for sharing your email address. If anyone wants to um, contact Katie with questions, uh, her email's in the chat, katie at betterfoodfoundation.org, or you can sign up at greenerbydefault.com. So that concludes the presentation. Thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope to see you all soon. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Katie.